so just to introduce myself, um, Steve Pritchard, a guy who lives in the UK, um, not too far from Champagne, so it's just about doable with um, the Channel Tunnel in about five and a half hours. And I sort of fell into Champagne about um, 25 years ago, uh, just before the millennium. <clears throat> um, it was an area that I found extremely challenging. No disrespect to Jasper, but um, the still ones for me um, are probably more about um, sight and, and more about the, the growers themselves, whereas Champagne was this whole technical process, this front-to-end process involving vineyards, people, um, vinification, and with so many dynamics and complexities. And, you know, coming from a, an IT Originally, I was a games programmer back in the day for Nintendo and Sega, and then through the years, you know, business um, software and project management for IT. Um, it really, really sort of ticked my buttons in terms of problem solving and, and you know, analysis. <clears throat> as, uh, as Michael mentioned, you know, I've spent the last sort of few years writing various articles for uh, Tom Canavan's wine pages. Um, so for both Grand Marks and, and Grows as well. Um, my approach, as I mentioned, to, to Champagne um, is a technical one. I enjoy champagne for champagne's sake, but what I also like to know is why does this champagne taste this way? What is it about this that I like? What did the grower do or what happened in that vintage or in that vineyard um, to encourage me, you know, to, and, you know, encourage me to sort of think about it and, and understand, you know, the arom aromas and the structure and the things that you get the other side, you know, why are they there? So um, to cut a long story short, so Jasper and I sort of um, talked about uh, 2008 horizontal, something he wanted to do, you know, moving to Pinot Noir and Chardonnay outside of the, the Burgundy region. And so that segued nicely into a more longer term re relationship. Um, so I'm in a good part in, in terms of my life, in terms of having some space and time to dedicate more time to this um, sort of endeavour. So here I am. So hopefully over the next sort of um, few years, um, there'll be more articles coming, maybe one every six weeks or two months. Um, hopefully we'll get a chance um, to, to catch up a lot more in the future and, and discuss all things Champagne. So I think without further ado, shall we just go right into our sort of first flight? <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're on a bit of a, a grand magical mystery tour of the Appalachians of, of, of Champagne. So we're starting off in the um, Montagne de Rance, um, and then we're going to head right south to the uh, via the Côte de Blanc and, and de Vies and, uh, and head down to the Aube. And then we're coming back um, more towards the north for our final flight, which is um, Ulysse Colling, which is um, based in the Côte de Cézanne, which is um, just south of the, the Côte de Blanc. Um, a nice sort of variation of styles here. I'm going to go very quickly in terms of, you know, these are definitely in a grower style, in a more modern grower style. So emphasis on sight, emphasis on oak. Um, I would say more sympathetic vinification, you know, if we look at the grand marks. They tend to sort of almost science uh, to death the, uh, the production of their wines, whereas the growers like to sort of be more sympathetic and more considerate to their sites. So in, in the first flight, did you say you poured six wines there, Michael? Is that correct? The first six of our list? Yeah, so we have five at the five moment. Minutes. Five, the okay. So we have three, three Breche and, and two Aigle, yeah? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, so... Let's just talk about the the, the Beresh in, in general. So um, a historic um, grow producer, it started back in 1847 and um, a label that I tried on and off over the years, they sort of came onto the radar. Um, you know, they have quite a large number of holdings now. I mean, when they started off um, back in the day, I think they had just a couple of hectares and now they have 9.5 hectares all over the Montagne de Rance. Um, you know, Jean-Pierre and, and Catherine, um, they've handed over to Raphael and Vincent, you know, and uh, and you can see since those guys took over in, in the early 2000s, there's been a real definite change in philosophy, you know, embracing more oak, um, individualizing sites in the champagnes, lowering the dosage, which seem, seem to be, um, you know, a bit more of um, <clears throat> a bit more of a thing now in, in, in gross uh, champagne. Um, if we start with the first wine, which is Le Crin, which I think is the, the, the wine that made them famous. Um, so the Crin on the uh, Lou de Terroir, which is the northern Montagne de Rance. It is a, a, a fine point at the top of the hill and it's very, very easy to see. And this comes from two vineyards. So we have the, the Eau Plante, which is on the, the west facing uh, portion. And then the Van Saint Jean. I have to look that one up because it's a new one for me. Um, these are a half hectare parcel, <clears throat> in total 45 year vines and mainly um, planted to chalk. So if you look at these, they, they're quite sloped and um, you know a lot of topsoil erosion. So you get a lot of mineral intensity of the wine. So do we want to start with the, the um, maybe the two 2014s together? So let's quickly jump to, to I, 
uh, a double plot, um, Brise Po and uh, Foiteur. Um, the first one is a 50% Pinot Noir, 50% Chardonnay. This one is 80% Pinot Noir and 20% Chardonnay. And again, um, West Facing and a really steep 45% gradient for, for the eye plot. So uh, do we just want to have uh, a little taste of those before we talk about 2014? Do we have some initial feedbacks from, from the first points? I find the first one, it's a bit rounder. Yeah. But as intense or as, as long as the second one. And then uh, I've already kind of skipped on to the third one. I really like the third one, but but maybe I'll pause there. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add. Yeah, so and that's unusual because I mean um allude on the on the northern montane rants, you would tend to find more chiseled and and warmer wines. But yet um, I think what we can probably say in 2014, it was an unusual vintage. So there was a lot of um, botrytis in, in the Pinot Noir. So it's more of a Chardonnay re, uh, vintage, really, um, in terms of uh, the Cote de Blanc was very, very successful. Um, I think um, also as well, if you look at um, the Grand Valley de, de Le Mans, which is where I is on, on the, you know, near the river, um, that suffered quite a lot. So the Montagne Durant tends to be the better Pinot Noir terroir um, of that vintage. So the fact that it's a little more rounder is not necessarily because it has less structure or, or, or extract. It may be because it's just a, a, a warmer vintage for them. And they had um, less than just philia, um, fruit fly infection, which they had quite a lot of that in eye. So you tend to get a lot more uh, bitterness in, in, the, um, in the wines and, and botrytis bitterness as well, that apricot sort of aroma in, in the eye uh, portion. Is there any other feedback on those wines? Um, what, what do you think of the, um, I, on my personal favorite actually, I mean, I, I just love uh, Le Crin, uh, uh, vintage in, vintage out. It, it, it's always a, a wine that to me sort of um, really emphasizes the, the Beresh style. That is, we have that citrus sort of laced um, sort of complexity, you know, that, that thrust of, of, of Chardonnay, but it always has that savoriness of the, of the oak-based Pinot Noir. What about for you guys? Uh, first one is quite acidic. Yeah. The acidity seems to be very strong. Yeah. So uh, except number three, I think number three is a little more round, a little more ready. And so the question is that uh, how long can you hold on? Because to me, the acidity, I mean, you can go for another easily five years. So, um, yeah, let, let's it's, talk about acidity and, um, and aging of, of champagne. So um, acidity is an indicator, but not necessarily the most important one of, of, of age worthiness. So when we look at um, when, when winemakers um, look to, to see how their wines will age, they look at um, pH, um, which is, you know, um, not necessarily the same as acidity. It's related to it, of course. Um, but I think balance and dry extract and neutrality as well in terms of neutral base ones are also good indicators. So I think it's interesting that um, 2014 for Pinot Noir is probably one I would not age for the long term. I would age in the medium term. Um, there's probably a little too much oxidative tendency because of the fruit fly infections, because of the botrytis of the year. Um, that, that means that I would probably consider those wines a medium term bet. But knowing Barash, you know, not, they don't have the issues of some growers. So they are excellent wines in their own right, but they are wines to be enjoyed, you know, with that real three to five year post disgorgement um, uplift that you tend to get in, in Champagne, that real sort of pickup in aroma. I think Ambonet in 2016. So 2016. Um, is a little bit more of a, a riper year in terms of, of the fruit, although you do have that sort of nice acidity too. Um, Ambonet is, is also a very, very interesting sort of crew. It's, it's very, very neutral. Um, you tend to find a lot of the Grand Marks blend Ambonet in um, to complement between very acidic sort of Chardonnay based wines and the more structured sort of Verzi Verzenay sort of um, Pinot Noir wines. It is that neutral middle ground and, you know, it always is. And um, it's interesting, you know, and, and we probably will see this a little more with the, the Egli as well. It has that roundness. It has that real sort of pear fruit, that, that real, um, you know, mouth filling and, and mouth coating texture. But uh, again, it, it ne doesn't necessarily have the attack and, and length and linearity of, of say, a Lude or Montandurant. It is more mouth filling and, and broader on the palate. But to your point, uh, yes, I, I would probably 
drink the the Ambonet, uh right now because that crew sort of lends itself to sort of more short termism, um, particularly in a in a bottle format. Sorry, and and you do feel free to interrupt me. I I do get very caught up and passionate about um, these wines, so um, I I can tend to sort of go on a, a little bit. So you feel free to give me a kick and uh, and interrupt me. We'll do. We'll do. All right, Chief. Do we um did we skip to the the eggly yet or um I I guess you guys it's five five glasses of champagne there's there's no way you're not going to touch any of them really you know <laughs> yeah we already have the eggly so we can also talk about that too. Yeah, let, let's talk about, so we have two vintages in front of us. I believe we have the 2004, which I, I'm not sure the disgorgement, but I mean, that's likely to have been disgorged maybe um, around 2012, 2013. Um, that's in a magnum format, which is our only magnum today. And then we have the 2012. <clears throat> so very quickly, the Eggly style. So, um, you know, very much um, what I call the second generation of growers behind the Solosses and, and the Vilmars. But again, probably now sort of behind the third generation, which is now appearing. Um, very much um, also, uh, you know, a man passionate about sight, particularly about Ambonet itself. Um, there's a little bit of comedy in terms of my relationship with, with um, Francis. Um, I tried to see him two times in 2007 and 2009, and, and both times he had problems with, with, with his children at school, and, um, and I missed him at the, the domain. So I didn't catch up to him until the first time in 2011. And I think what struck me then, um, was his, his passion first and foremost, but he, the way he embraced oak, and you know not just in the in the normal sense, you know a lot of people ferment in oak, but he also sort of ate just a little bit of aging in oak too, and um, you know and uh, that really sort of um, highlights his style, and um, you know when we look at um, his vintage wine, I always felt his vintage wine probably suffered a little bit in the uh, reputation and behind the you know the the VLV uh, Blanc de Noir that he used to produce and also some of his money and, and other plots. But I think in, in the last, probably since the 2008 vintage, and you know, William Kelly gave that, that wine um, 100 points and, and hence prices have now increased. He's put real focus onto those plots, you know, and, um, and it, it's a wine that's coming very much into its own. Again, dosage is very low at term two grams per litre. Um, 2012 and 2004 are interesting contrast of vintages. Um, so 2004 was a very precocious vintage. Uh, the vines were absolutely unbelievable in their um, activity. I mean, they people were green harvesting back to 10,000 gram, uh, 10,000 kilograms, and then there would be more bud break and there would be more grapes appearing on the vines. You literally could not control the monster. Uh, that was a little bit to do with the 2003 phenomena. So in 2003, there was massive triage, very, very low yields, um, heat stress, water stress. Um, we had a lot of droughts here in Europe. And, and so what happened was there were very few grapes to harvest and what um, the vines kept on photosynthesizing until very late in the year. So what that meant was that there was a carbohydrate built up in the, in the, um, in the vines, in the root stock. And so 2004 actually leveraged the heat of 2003. So your 2004 character, that is that fluffy, um, light phenolic um, sort of character early on. And then this quite balanced acidic and then sort of fruity flavors and, and then toasty flavors which develop later on are thanks to the 2003 phenomena. You know, it's a vintage made the year before. 2012 has a similar sort of concentration with low yields. So this was post financial crisis where the Champenoise were told to control um, their uh, yields by the CIVC. So there's a lot of green harvesting and pruning to get the yields down around 10,000 uh, kilograms, I believe, per hectare. And so the... Um, you know, whereas the, um, and there was also a lot of stress as well. So for different reasons, there was also some frost stress as well in 2012. So the, the yields were kept low artificially and, and naturally, you know, unlike 2008, where that was a little bit of a natural sort of um, triage yield. So the 2012, very precocious vintage, very concentrated, a lot of really upfront fruity aromas and, um, you know, a, a wine that is easy to drink, but 2012s are uniformly excellent and a, a real superb vintage. So that's my, my intro for those wines. So l tell me about what you think about the, the Eggly. I mean, I'm particularly interested in the, the Magnum format of 2004. It's a wine I've not tried, uh, the 2004 in that, in that format. So that, that's going to be very interesting to taste. A lot of interest in the 04 the, the Mag. Um, and uh, Feels like a step up in terms of quality versus the first three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. In terms of winemaking, yeah. I don't know if that's because it's a 
as you know, ground to single, you know, vintage crew. Or... I, I think it's um. So I mean, when we talk about magnums, and you know. It's no mystery to all of us here, you know, probably as, as connoisseurs that, you know, bottles and, and magnums are, are, are chalk and cheese, you know, magnums tend to always be slightly more structured, fresher and, you know, and, and will age longer. I think champagne being fundamentally a reductive wine and, you know, with reductive winemaking, it spends a lot of time on lees in its autolysis and, you know, magnum format to really, really pushes champagne almost to where it needs to be. So it would be actually be very interested if you tried an originally discourse 2004 alongside that magnum. I think that would be very diagnostic and maybe something we will try and do in the future, try and get some originally discord magnum and bottles of the same wine to, to compare. But I, I feel there's a little bit of winemaking there, um, a little bit of terroir, as you say, Michael, but I think it's probably fundamentally the, the format itself, which promotes freshness and complexity. Do we have any, um, I mean, I think the interesting comparison as well would be to the, the Beresh Ambonet, the, the 16, um, just to see that that crew, the, the sort of mid palate generosity that you get with that crew, um, the rounded, more sort of apricot, sort of um, uh, generous orchard fruits as opposed to the, the stone orchard fruits of the Montana. I mean, is that, is that coming through? Is that translating? So I can't hear you guys if you were, you're were talking. I, I think so. I, I think 16 uh, vintage is, is, is probably a little more fresher at the moment. Um, I also think stylistically Baresh may have, um, you know, a little, you know, that little bit more sort of um, focus on, on the citrus aroma. Uh, uh, you know, the dosage is, is slightly higher. Um, let me, uh, I mean, just check my notes. So that's La Toure, um in, um, in Ambonet for the, the Baresh. So, if I look at that site, so that's that's probably a little bit more um, sort of um, southern facing, a bit more ge uh, generosity and, and where it is, where I think Egli tends to blend a lot of sites. And so you're going to find an aggregation of, of the vintage for, for Egli, um, whereas Bresh is very site specific. And I know that site is, is very much um, has a lot of intensity, you know, and I can understand why. For Ambonet, you know, it's more neutral and on the Egli. For, for Baresh, it has more intensity. So I can understand that um, distinction there. What do we think of the Magnum? I'm, I'm, I'm still sort of vicariously interested in, in how um, sort of that, that Magnum is, is tasting. Is it still fresh? Do we have some um, development in there? There's still five more in the pack. So when you come to Hong Kong, you can try one. <laughs> I think you all like the Magnum, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, big thumbs up. Yeah, big thumbs up. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, it's superb, right? Beautiful. Superb. Still a bit fresh, you know. Still Very fresh. Yeah, right? still a little fresh, but still I think young. Yeah, I'm still young. Still yeah, young. Yeah. Starting to develop that at secondary. The, has a, has a potential, right? has a, yeah, the potential cake. Yeah. And, and you know magnums do that i mean it's invariably the bottles tend to, to be showier um you know more flashy more fleshy um yes. uh, if but you know the magnums always keep something in reserve you know they are those long aging um supermodels that never seem to sort of um <laughs> sort of lose it you know and um with champagne that is is, is so it as well and particularly the low dosage i mean you know dosage and, and maillard reactions are the friend of champagne and the longer and slow that those happen in the bottle, the you know the the quality of the aroma tends to be a little bit better. And you know that's I think that's um, sort of um, deceiving, you know, uh, you know, in terms of the format itself. But again, I think magnum formats are something that we would like to, I would like to explore with you further and, and compare those to bottles, you know, and, and even the Gero, if we can possibly do that, Michael. It's it's um, a, such a, a diagnostic thing to do next to each other, and and maybe for the future we'll, we will go there and and just to see how in, instructive that can be. Well, sounds like we have our next tasting lined up. <laughs> Indeed, we do. Um, guys, I don't know how you, you're looking. Um, do we want to look at the, the second flight yet, or, or do you want to enjoy the first flight a bit more? Uh, yes, yeah, we have uh, the two Cedric Bouchards for. Um, okay, so let's talk about Bouchard. So um, I always con consider Cedric um, as a, a, one of the new growers, but it's, it's probably dating me in terms of that he's now very much established and in, in the second generation. Um, Cedric probably for me was the the first grower that really looked at um, plots in, as, as individuals. You know, far earlier than then, Loss probably did. 
um, you know, not just as a as a crew as a village level, but but as a plot level wine, you know. And he had his one 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 approach, which is uh, you know single parcels, single varieties, single vintage, you know. And um, it's excellent and 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 so and thrilling to taste these wines and and those individual expressions. Unfortunately, they've become rarer because of that, and you know more expensive. So it is a real privilege for you guys to to taste those wines there. Um, Interesting um, sort of bit of background. So the, the Rosé de Jean, um, which is um, actually named after his Polish grandmother, in, in but um, spoken as French, you know, and he had a lot of love for, for his grandmother. And, you know, clearly that love for, for um, the way she um, sort of treats him, she was very kind and gentle, he used to say, but, but, but very sort of honest with him. And um, he said that's what really wanted to drive his winemaking, you know, into his wines. They are exceptionally low yields, um, you know, um, as a rule of thumb, um, sort of um, sparkling wines can take yields probably maybe two, two and a half times that of, a, of an ordinary sort of burgundy or, or still blood. But um, Cedric's taken it the other way. You know, he's gone ultra low, 4,000 um, kilos per hectare, um, which is, you know, phenomenally low. I mean, even some of the super low plots uh, don't even get close to that. Um, there's, um, so I think you have um, two ones. So the first, Paul, let me just check which ones they are. So it's the Rosé de Jean, which is the Creux de Enfer, which is the Rosé de Saunier. So Saunier, so um, made, made by the crush method, crush, macerate, leave the skin contact um, with the, with the um, red skins for, um, I think, three or four hours and then bleed off the, the red wine and, um, later. So Saunier, re really meaning bleed off um, in French. Um, you have a, a second wine. Um, which is the um, Brute Nature, which is this mystery secret wine that Michael told me about. Um, I'm as blind as you guys are to that. So this is a, a wine where we have no reveal of the grapes, of, of what's gone into that, uh, of, of the vintage even, or, or, or what, um, what disgorgement it is. All I know is that it is a, 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 brute, a brute Nature, um, which is with, without dosage. Um, I think um, just to, to close off the summary on, on Cedric, so I, the important thing for me is how his style is defined. Um, I don't necessarily agree with him, but he thinks that you should, um, and he's a little bit with Salos on this, where you should make a still wine first and a sparkling wine second. And, and he feels that sparkling and, and the bubble method that um, gets in the way of, of his aromas. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that in Champagne in general, but you have to say whatever he does, um, the wines are absolutely fantastic and they age too, but the amount of autolysis is minimal. I mean, 15, 15 to 18 months on yeast, the minimum he can get away with. So we have fruit to the fore. Um, we have a, a real sort of smart oak style. So this is the southern part of Champagne, so it is very ripe. Uh, uh, but yet they, they age with finesse and complexity and they never really lose their their. Um, freshness and um, you know I cry a little bit when I look at the market prices because there are wines in the past which I've loved to buy and and and, um, and age you know but it's it's going to be harder for us to do that in the future so you know guys enjoy the privilege of trying these wines so I hand over to the table what what do we think of the the first two wines? Seven. Uh, so, well so, definitely seven. So Steve seven. I think yeah, there's a bit of um, maybe these are too young yeah. Um, it's, yeah. Uh, obviously, these these only arrived from the import yeah. like six months ago. Okay. But, but, the, but the problem is, you only get a bottle from the importer these days. Yeah. Oh, really super rare yeah. Well, so I think you know, tasting the two, people like seven. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Do you know how much they produce? No. Very small production. Three hundred, five hundred. I don't know. I don't know, Steve. <laughs> of the rosé, the the uh, how many how many bottles does he produce? I think it's think? a couple of thousand, maybe a few thousand, the most. Um, uh, it's um, production varies year on year, um, but th that that tends to be the average. For the mystery cuvee, I have no idea what it is or what the production level. You can guarantee it's going to probably number in the hundreds of bottles. Um, <laughs> so it's, you, you have the two thousand eighteen vintage. There, is that correct? So the 2018 is, is the first one of um, a warm sinks of vintages we had. So if we look at 2017, it was a very good Chardonnay year, but a cooler year. Um, Pinot Noir suffered a lot of botrytis, a lot of rot and oidium and, uh, and mildew. Whereas 18 was a, a, a warm grown so cycle, the first one of three. So we have the 18, 19, 20 trilogy. 18 um, probably suffered a small amount of heat stress. So there are a lot of um, sort of um, uh, high yield. 
very warm year, but I, I think the, the heat came in during the, the crucial period of Raisel, which is when the color changes in the um, in the grapes, in the skin of the grapes, it's when the, the skins thicken. It's when the um, sort of uh, acidity starts being digested by enzymes and, and the ripeness occurs aromatically. So you want cool, cool um, sort of evenings for that. And because of the vegetative cycle is so early now, um, early August, uh, it's sort of, you know, an early August where Verizon starts to happen. Um, we're not getting those cool nights, we're getting warm nights. So a lot of that en enzymatic um, activity is getting very high. So a lot of acidity is being digested. So you get in this combination of, of ripe neutral fruit um, with some aromatic development, which is unusual for champagne or historically was unusual for champagne. But we're also not getting the, the phenolic ripeness that we used to have. So we're getting something that's a little bit lighter, um, still has some acidity but tends to have still wine um, sort of flavors and aromas with very early disgorge champagne. So on the 18, uh, with, with, with 18 months worth of, of, of uh, Lee's aging, you're not going to get a lot of autolytic characters. So you're going to get a lot of fruity, almost still wine character with that wine. And again, it's probably going to appear very young and neutral versus a Burgundy um, style. A lot of information um, there, there, guys. Sorry if I'm, I'm overloading your information. I probably do encourage you to maybe watch the recording back. And also, um, I do have some precise note sets as well related to these wines, which I'm very happy to send the audience after here with some technical information in there. Yeah, is this the... Um, uh, uh, so um, which which one are we talking about here? The... Um, uh, the numbers... Rotate. The feel it's changing in the glass. Yeah. Rotate. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the, 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 I mean, rosés, I mean, it's, it's very hard to be precise because, you know, in, vintage is also individual as well. And, you know, what I tend to do with, with all my champagnes at home is that, you know, um, I never look at a bottle and think I'm going to open this and leave this for, for, for 18, uh, you know, 90 minutes or, 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 two, or two hours. You know, it, it's probably one where um, if I'm there, I can finesse the, the decision a little bit. And, you know, quite often I will open the bottle, leave it in a, a very shallow ice bucket with some ice in there and then have pause and then leave a little bit in the glass. And I think the important thing for me is that probably um, you are better if you can to leave wine in the glass than in the bottle, uh, let it warm up with the air, air rate, let it warm up with atmosphere. I think the problem you have is that if we, if we did that for, for 15 wines here, um, you're gonna have a, a very crowded um, sort of room, you know, and, and a very confusing table. Um, and I, I, I fear for health and safety with, with what um, almost 300 pieces of stemware on your table. So um, I, I think it's a necessary eel for us. But yes, in hindsight, maybe it, it would be better to open that a little bit closer to, to the pour time. Do we also have the um, Solosses and the, the um, Prevost also poured? Start to yeah, open, right? So maybe we come back to it because I think I'll just yeah, there's still quite a bit in the bottle. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. What I think would be interesting is now that we're going into Prevost. The last yes. one. Uh, wow. uh, Raymond told me I need to find Prevost. So I went <laughs> out my way to the UK market, found some Prevost cases and shipped them over. Wow. wow. Cool. So this one is the, the rose, right? And then mm -hmm. uh, then we've got some Jaxelos and Guillaume. Maybe Fast asleep on those three. So let, let me. Um, I, it, this is probably a little bit of um, a fireside chat with cigars and brandy. So let, let's start the story at the beginning. Let's talk about Jacques Salos. So I think it, it is safely to say that um, almost sin, single handedly, maybe with a little bit of help of Vilmar, he started the craze for, for Gros Champagne. So I mean, Gros as a as a thing have been around since the uh, you know the the nineteen sixties nineteen seventies. There's been a lot of production cellar door, but you know um, they've always been below the radar sort of production. Um, historically, very very cheap for a lot of growers. Um, I could tell you some prices I used to pay in the early two thousands for some of these growers, and you'd probably be uh, crying into your napkins. So um, let, let let me let me cheer you up and, and tell you the story of so the losses. Um, Jacques Salos, uh, Anselm Salos inherited um, his domain. And I think then what was very clear to him, he wanted to do something that was um, a little bit more individual. So a lot of the growers were following the, um, the story of the Grand Marks. So at the time when, when growers became popular, a lot of stainless steel, sort of vat ferments, um, a lot of sites were getting blended into Grand Terroirs. So Cote de Blanc style or, or across um, Sapages. So what he wanted to do was take his mainly of these holdings, and, you know, and do something a little bit different, something a little bit, bit more artisanal. Um, it's interesting to talk to Anselmi. I mean, it's he's a character that's very divisive. And I'll, I will admit that over the years, I've seen him a few times 
and I scratch my head at some of his decisions um, in terms of, you know, why he wanted to do things. Um, but what I would have to say, he's always been honest and he's always said to me, you know, this is something that I never want to do in the scripted way, in a formulaic way. Um, you know, we he wants to make wines um, that are honest, not only to the site, um, to, to Champagne itself, um, but to himself, but also to the vintage too. And, and that's very important to understand. And, um, you know, um, he attracted a lot of attention. I mean, he had so many disciples and one of those was, was Jerome Prevost. So Jerome is, is, is a little bit away from um, uh, sort of the, the Côte de Blanc and Avis and he's a place called Gure and um, in Pinot Meunier country. And he had a lot of vines, which for, for many years um, he inherited, but was didn't feel he could make those best wines. So he sort of um, sold those grapes onto the, um, the negociants and uh, and the grand marks and then he was prompted by his mom just said hey one day go follow your passions go make your wines and you know and uh, Jerome is is very much um, you know since the 1980s doing that you know um, he he's following his passions as an artiste you know he was a disciple of Silos so follows very similar to winemaking philosophies a lot of oak, uh, a lot of individuality um, sort of low sulfur across um, the the um, across the, the board, although um, Anselmi Salos um, sort of does a, uses a little bit more sul, um, sul, sulfur um, at appropriate times. And we'll talk a little bit that, um, I mean, I think 2005 is very important to talk about and and, and SO2. And then finally, we have uh, Guilhem um, Salos, um, so the, the son of Anselm. So he, he, he passed... Um, uh, the the baton uh, to to his son and um, you know a lot of people were saying hey it's a change of a generation what's going to happen to to the 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 domain of uh, Jacques um, but I I think it's in very very safe hands you know and there's a very interesting um, evolution and revolution going on as well so you we thought that Jacques probably invented the the book on individuality I think it's safe to say that Guillaume, um since 2012. Um, you know, by buying vines in and and the wine that we have here is by bought-in vines uh, from, from the Aube. Um, he's doing his own thing too. And I think what he will do, he will take the domain of Jacques Salos and he will finesse it and 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 put some individuality on there. So um, let's start with the Provost then, which I think is the, the first pour. So I think we have a, another rosé. Um, not clear what the, um, the lot is on here, LC13. So um, I'm not sure if that's the 13 based uh, vintage or if it's the, the the 13 bottled which would be the 12 base uh, but again uh, Provost has a lot of um, the umami uh, sort of uh, mouthfeel a lot of savory character uh, a little bit of red fruit um, around in us but a lot of power extracted from oxidative sort of character you know and um, and the money of course has that very sort of flowery finesse when young and and that very meaty savory style when it sort of starts to pick up some age so I'll let you guys taste and the Provost first of all. Do you want to give some quick um, feedback before we go to the Salosses? So when you look at Jacques Salos, um, the, the 2005, and then Guillaume Salos. Guillaume has taken over since 2012, is that right? He has, but not the Jacques Salos domain. So I think it's around maybe the last three or four years he, he's had domain in Jacques Salos. Um, okay, got he, it. So, so originally, he, um, so I, I have some interesting facts here. So the Lager is actually made from oak fruits and so nothing to do with the uh, Côte de Blanc. So very, very different style, as I say, very, very um, ripe from a, a parcel called the Corsain uh, parcel from um, uh, a guy called Jérôme um, Corsain, um, who owns a, a large 3.3 hectare monopole uh, in the centre of the village. Um, you know, it's, it's very much 100% um, Pinot Noir in style. 45 year old vines. It's a southern exposure on an all very wa uh, warm climate. Um, and it's clay limestone. So uh, clay limestone tends to sort of exaggerate power and fruit and being Pinot Noir as well, southern um, exposure and, and ripeness. Whereas the um, Celos is, is Chardonnay, it's from a Vise, so a, a, a flinty, sometimes apple fruit style. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and a not a lot older vintage as well. And I think there's a, there's a bit of a difference in, in the, you know, the aging. Yep. So Salos has a lot of bottle aging there as well. 
Uh, uh, Steve, what's the grape composition of the uh, number nine, uh, the, the Jacques Solot, uh, 2005? So it's it's 100% uh, Avise and, um, and and Chardonnay fruit. So Blanc de Blanc um, for all intents and purposes. Um, the, the individual plots I can tell you here are um, the Mont de Cramont and um, the Chantelain in, in Avise. So if you imagine Avise has um, it's quite a lot of slopes heading down towards the southern part of the Côte de Blanc. And you get a lot of um, chalk in the midsection. Um, there's a lot of clay and accumulation at the bottom and a lot of shallow soils at the top. Um, so um, the 2005 vintage was very, very interesting. So uh, a little bit difficult on, on all grape varieties. So we had a lot of botrytis in there. So if you've tried sort of Dom Perignon and other styles, there is a very botrytis style in the Champagne. So a lot of that um, bitter apricot aroma that you get on the finish from the um, the, the gluconic acid that you, you get from, from that um, noble rot. In 2005 as well, so um, Solos normally would not um, use um, any sulfur in his, in his winemaking or very little, but because of the botrytis threat, he actually added some uh, sulfur dioxide into the winemaking. So he protected against um, botrytis, um, first of all, but actually an unintended consequence, he actually protected the wine from a little bit of oxidation. So I'm finding the 2005 a little more fresher than some of his other wines. And probably a, a little bit fresher than than Pinot Noirs from from later vintages too. Sorry, sorry, Steve. Sorry, just yeah. going back to the Provence. Is it hundred percent Pinot Meunier? Yep, it is indeed. Yes, yep, the Provence is yes. Yep. Very impressive yeah. to do a Pinot Meunier rosé hundred percent like that and this quality. I was looking for for um for the bouquet. So um the last time I tasted this <clears throat> probably five years ago. Or four years ago. Um, it may have even been a Parisa release sampling. I can't remember when I tasted it. Um, but it was very, very fresh style. So um, it, it is very much that salty umami style, isn't it? It's, it's very much food related, uh, interesting um, uh, bouquet and, and aromatic nuances as well. Mounier um, is an underrated variety. We, we incorrectly call it Pinot Mounier. It's actually sort of a. Uh, 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 you know, uh, Mounier is, is not Pinot, is, uh, first of all, it's, it's halfway between the two, it's actually a, a clone of its own. And it, um, it's an interesting mid-palate richness. I mean, Pinot Noir tends to dominate the finish and have a little bit of an attack. Chardonnay is the other way around, where uh, Mounier seems to be very quiet on the finish and, and the, and the uh, attack. So you have to rely on winemaking that to, to fill in those gaps. But mid-palate strength, Pinot, uh, the, the Mounier is second to none. Um, I have to stop calling Pinot Money. I, I, I will get um, violently attacked by various champagnes if I keep doing Guillaume Salas yes. um, does not seem as impressive as the Jacques Salas. Stylistically, similarities. Yeah, later, I mean, 2015 base vintage, I, I think the latest one is, can, I mean, I don't know if you can confirm from the back of the bottle, that is the one you have, which is a 2019 or 20 disgorgement. Let us check, let us check. Okay. And, and, you you know, bottle age is everything. I mean, you, you know, I um, had a conversation um, with um, Richard Geoffroy of, of, of Dom Perignon when he released it in 2008, and I said to him, what would you have? Um, because, you know, they they concentrate on their, their Enotech, uh, their long lease aging, and I said, what would you have? Long lees aging recently disgorged, or would you have less lees aging and originally disgorged with more bottle age? And he said, it's always the latter. He said, you know, as much as I love autolysis and how it suits the reductive style of Dom Perignon, you know, bottle age is the friend of champagne. Um, you know, well-stored bottles are thrilling, you know, and um, there's that fine fine balance, isn't there, between bottle age and, and autolysis. And I think the Salos has probably had that time in the bottle where it really... Um, you know, and I, I, I'll be honest, I'm not a, of all, a fan of all of Solos's wines. Um, I find a lot of them far too savoury and oxidated for my, my um, sort of um, palate. But, you know, the 2005 is one that really, that does appeal, you know, in one of his success stories, you know. And um, I can see why that probably um, belittles the, the son's um, attempt um, with different fruit. And I think we've got terroir at play here. I mean, Aviz is a grand terroir. Um, you know, it's Chardonnay. Um, 2005 is, is it probably a better vintage for Chardonnay than it was for Pinot Noir, whereas 2019 is a very ripe um, and a very recent, sorry, 2015 is a, a ripe and very recent vintage. And 
and suffers from a little bit of greenness as well. So heat stress in 2015 means that the, the, the vine shut down in that crucial veraison. So a lot of the, the acids are still green. So you have ar aromatic sort of um, ripeness and, um, and almost fruit ripeness, but you have this green sort of acidity which uh, dominates the finish. And it's a very strange vintage and a hard one to work. Um, there are not many vintages which have uh, grows which have succeeded in that vintage, even though the weather was stunning. Again, a lot of information I've piled in there, and I, I, I do encourage you um, if you want to go back over and watch a recording. Um, and I'm happy to write this stuff down too. If, um, if you have any special requests for, for future articles, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to accommodate them with this sort of information too. I would like to ask is it that uh, the, the son and father is it use the same? Same winya or uh, different different winya for the cellos. So it's interesting. So I, I'm not sure how this is going to play out in the long term. So it's not been revealed how they will evolve this going in the future. But for for the examples that you have here, so uh, so Guilham sort of uh, did his own sort of um, route. So he didn't have access of the 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 father's domain. So you know that cellos bought a lot of plots in I. Um, and and other grand crews, not not just for for Pinot Noir but for Chardonnay too. And um, so the son sort of had to buy in and, and negotiate the plot. So for the, the one that you have here, it's from the, the Ob. Um, so um, the gentleman is called Jerome uh, Curson. Um, it's in the Vilsa Arc. And um, it's so it's in the, the south of, um, of the um, part of Champagne. So there's a lot of clay soils there. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I think this Kimmeridgian soil, I think, was also here, which is very similar to, to Chablis too. Um, whereas in, in the V's is a lot of flints, there's a lot of um, bellum neat and, and and other sort of small chalky aspects as well, uh, with different depth of topsoil. So for the Salos and the V's, uh, Chardonnay versus the Pinot Noir and the bright southern fruit of, of the of the Gulam. So one more question. For the, uh, the this Scotch Monday is 2017, right? So there are a lot of yeah. vintage. Is it a single vintage or a free yeah, vintage mixed together? Um, so I think there is, um, let me just show you, I think there's a little bit of reserve wine now in there. Um, it used to be single vintage. Um, I know he mentioned that he would, he may um, build up a little bit of reserve wine, but I don't think there's a lot, even if there is, I think you're going to pretty much get vintage dominating there. So that was a 2017 disgorgement. So I'm guessing that's, can we check if the bottle mentions if the base wine's 2013 maybe or 14? Do we know? Okay. 12. 12, okay. So interesting. So, um, the 12 is a very concentrated vintage now 2012 in in the Aube was actually quite a difficult vintage i mean we we talk about it being a great and grand vintage for champagne but yes the Aube, um very a lot of problem with frost a lot of problem with hail a uh, lot very low yields and um and so probably a little more difficult than it was maybe for for the north of champagne and the Côte de blanc montaigne durant and the grand valet you know okay <laughs> single vintage single vintage yeah, interesting. Okay, I th I do believe he may be pushing for some, but I, I will check that for you. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> so, loss is a very interesting character, and um, you know, um, I some of his why make a decision type I've never really understood. Um, because he almost uh, appears to be trying to make burgundy, and then putting bubbles in afterwards, uh, and then having long lees aging, which is slightly contradictory. Um, you know. Having said that, that's probably my lack of understanding, if I'm honest, as, as much as anything, because, you know, I, Salos, I, I always said to him, look, the, the, you know, I, I open three of your bottles, they're the same wine, same, same disgorgement, and one wine will be oxidative, one wine will be fresh, and another wine will be somewhere in the middle, you know, what, how do you feel about that, you know, as, as, a, as a connoisseur buying a product, I, I concerns me with the variability, and he said, look, I'm making individual bottles here, you know, these are characters, um, you know, no wine is perfect in the vineyard, no what vinification is perfect, and no bottle or cork is perfect. You know, he said, I he said, even for me, the, the cork in itself has an individual contribution to make to the characteristic. And if that means it becomes too oxidative, so be it. He said if that means that it's too reductive, so be it. So um it, it's it's a very, very hard to nail down. Um I have to say the best wines from Salos are very chiseled very very intense you know it's it's that weightless intensity that we look in the best wines some of the wines i find frustrating you know for some of my very expensive bottles of wine have been very oxidized and and um and, you know for me and and it's not a style i enjoy as as easy as the next person and um i've been frustrating so 
uh, he, honestly, he's a frustrating yet brilliant character, and um, and I think he would probably smile if I if I mentioned that and sell me you're this person. He he would probably agree. He said, "Yeah, I am frustrating. People are, you know." I mean, uh, there's an interesting. Um, so 2005, um, you know, as a as a vintage was challenging. So as I said, to protect against the botrytis heat and uh, and other <clears throat> issues that they had in the ear, um, he used a lot of. Um, I use a lot of sulfur at pressing and you know sulfur dioxide not only protects the wine from oxidation of, of alcohol but it you know it also and its chief um usage is a preservative i mean if any of you have had um sort of dried fruit uh you know you know raisins and and uh, and other things there is so much sulfur dioxide free sulfur added to protect from oxidation you know and i have friends who who go on these um, health kicks and they won't touch wines because they say they're full of sulfites and um, yet they will be putting half a bag of, of raisins on their on their fruit in the morning, you know. And I say, look, you know, you've just added the equivalent of three magnums of my favorite champagne on, on one of your breakfasts in terms of the amount of sulfur. Pass me the champagne. You stick to your fruit, you know. <laughs> so and, um, you know, he it, it's not an evil. Sulfur is not an evil. But I understand for Salos, um, he doesn't want to be his wines defined by reductiveness, free sulfur and those other things. But he also doesn't want his wines to be defined by botrytis and, and other um, evils and beasties. Um, so, you know, in terms of um, bacterial, biological spoilage. So he does the right thing for him, which is he finds the right level. He's, his oxidation doesn't concern him, but botrytis and, and disease did. And so that's what he did with 2005. So, Steve, we're now having the Ulysse Colin being served, and the immediate comment that came around was like, wow. The yeah. mild, impressive. Say of all, all of these grows today, um, I love my breches, I love my Eglis, um, uh, Solosses, are, I, I have a love-hate relationship with um, Provost, but for Ulysse Colin, um, wow, indeed. And what can I say? I mean, based in the not so great terroir of, of Congi in the um, northern Coteau de Cezanne. So the Cezanne occupies this sort of space between the very warm and ripe fruit of the oak. Um, it's below the Grand Cruz of Montandarand, Grand Valet de la Mar and, and the, and the uh, Côte de Blanc. The fruit is, um, and it's fruit. I mean, when we talk about the area, let, let's talk about fruit, you know. Um, it's it's a little south of Vertu on the Côte de Blanc, uh, and 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 uh, about thirty kilometers south of of Epinay. Um, you know he had uh, a lot of his family's vines rented out to a large um, mark. I think it was it used to go into to Cristal and and some Dom Perignon up until two thousand three. <clears throat> um, the vines weren't in great shape. Um, no disrespect to his, his forebears or the people who used to look after his vines, but I think they used very uh, brutal um, yield orientated um, sort of cropping methods and he, he embraced the, the vines um, very much um, you know very much uh, it focused on organics and, and, and vineyard maintenance now he was also studied um, sort of uh, law for eight eight years ago which gives a very interesting um, slant on, on the way he approaches his winemaking he's very uh, precise um, again, he uses very minimal sulfur. Um, he uses hand harvesting, of course, as most of Champagne does. Um, the clusters are fully destemmed. Um, grapes very gently pressed, so you have a lot of um, grape expression, not a lot of um, stem uh, expression as you do with, with some areas. And he doesn't use any uh, fining or filtering. And, um, and he likes to disgorge during February. One, one of the, the strange parts of Champagne is that everybody likes to disgorge their wines after assemblage, which is, is, is May or June, which is very hot in Champagne. So he does a very sensible thing. Do in February, there's very, very uh, low issue with temperatures. Uh, uh, it means that oxidative behavior is, is very, very low. Um, the yeast is also very calm in the bottles as well, when you bring them up to the surface. And, um, you know, again, he does um, what um, Salos began and others do. He very much focuses on plot. And, um, wow, I mean, I, I know we, we reserve probably for, for an hour um, for, for the, the Zoom, but I'm, I mean, I'm happy to wait for another sort of 30 or 40 minutes if you guys still want to chat. Um, let's talk about what we have. I mean, we have uh, Le Melon, uh, which is on the Côte de Cézanne, which is a 100% Pinot Noir on a 2.5 hectare plot. 50-year-old vines, iron-rich clay over chalk soil. Then the Les Enfers, 
which is um, a 75 percent 2016, 25 percent 2015 uh, wine, which is 100 percent Chardonnay. So again, uh, 0.62 uh, um, hectare uh, UD, uh, 45 year old vines, eastern exposure for this and clay and silex topsoils over limestone. Um, the interesting one, which is Le Jardin de Ulis, uh, which is a pure 2016, um, a Chardonnay, Pinot Meunier and Pinot Noir, um, uh, in, also in, in, in Congi as well, so sharing a little similarity to the previous wine. And then we have uh, Le Roise, uh, which is a very unusual um, vineyard, um, uh, very specific um, uh, sort of um, geology here, which is clay and silex over limestone too. But also has a strict southern exposure, and um, and that that makes a hell of a difference with um, with certain vintages, and you know looking again, and this is also a blend seventy five percent two thousand sixteen twenty five percent two thousand fifteen. So I think the um, the triage of um, cepage is for two thousand sixteen is the only one we have there, and um, the last two uh, wines are also sort of chardonnay, so a good um, sort of um uh, sort of uh, cross section of the the cepage so i'll hand over to the floor um i can talk about this guy all day um again i am a little bit sort of having to mop up the tears off the floor using a, a large mop because um the the ones are not as cheap as they used to be and um you know and uh, they are in the collector sort of uh, regime in terms of um pricing you know um, very strict connoisseur level and and justly so um you know uh, these guys work a lot for for what they do and um, it, it should be no longer the merchants and then the, and the negotiants in the middle who who make the the profit you know these guys fully deserve to make their money so happy that this guy is now uh, receiving the prestige he deserves let me hand it over to the floor i um i finished my speech and happy to sort of let you taste and and fill questions sorry there's an intense discussion going between 11 and 12 at the moment okay but there's been a, there's a, I think there's a feeling that there's a, there's a, there's a very good quality of wines that are being poured at the moment. Yeah, so, and, and you know, and um, sometimes the recipes, I mean, I mean, I look to certain growers and, you know, like lots and some of the recipes that they use in terms of their winemaking technique. And, and, and let's get, let's not um, have any avoidance, you know, avoidance of the, of the true message here. You know, wine is a technical champagne. It is made in a technical way using a technical process and always will be. It's two fermentations. It has different vats involved, you know, different ways of training the three different grape varieties that you have massive difference in, in terms of terroirs difference in the way you can use dosage. You can use oak, you can use stainless steel, you know, the dynamics are, are impressively massive. And, you know, and send one of those dynamics. So, you know, in terms of finding and filtering, so the avoidance of that sometimes leads to heavy soupy wines, wines that are prone to oxidation because what you have is a wine that has a lot of spent or consumed um, phenol compounds. And, um, and that actually encourages oxidation and, and promotes oxidation and heaviness in, in aged wines. But for, 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 for Olivier, I think what he does is, um, finesse all of his winemaking, you know, so precise that lawmaking um, sort of degree that he has, and and his his you know approach to it, it, it comes through in his wines, so clear. And you know, I think to look to growers like um, Jean Paul uh, Ebra in you know up in um, up in uh, Marais, and uh, he does the same. You know, that same precise attention to detail, and it really comes on his wines. You know, the passion's there, but also the intensity in terms of the way he approaches it. Steve, Steve, so um, a bunch of guys when they had the number 13 board, yep. Le Jardin de Ulysse, that, that impressed a lot of people. <laughs> but you can tell the quality of the, all across the board. There's some people who still really like the Mayo 15. Yep. Uh, Enfers, obviously, uh, also great, but the Le Jardin de Ulysse is. Really is it very small production do you think uh, yeah very small production parcel level i mean if you look at the number of hectares on there you know you're talking a couple of thousand bottles max per, per each of these cuvées and um you know the i think um champagne's an interesting region and uh, when you look versus um sort of bergen burgundy or, or bordeaux some of the smallest plots in in champagne are minute and, you know and i look to even you know big wines that we saw you know Clos de Guas by Philippina and um, 
there's less than 20,000 bottles equivalent made in a vintage, which if you look compared to, um, you know, Moton Chandon, who probably make more sort of Brut Imperial, um, then maybe the rest of Champagne put together their non-vintage out, but, you know, it, it's small. And then you go down again to the grows. So, yes, I think some of these parcels numbering at the very minimum uh, thousands, I think maybe one of them is three, three and a half thousand. I do have um, some backup notes uh, somewhere else on my laptop with production numbers. And what I will do, let me add them to the notes here that I have on, on the on the breakdown and, um, and I'll send this spreadsheet to you guys for your consumption after the event. And, and Steve, do you think uh, the 48 months to the 60 months, it, it seems to make a difference? I mean, we have the Boises being poured at the moment. Yep. But just like to get your thoughts on why they decided to take that one extra year, what they do, because they do still release to the market both, right? And, you know, what's the logic out of that? So, I mean, this, you know, the, let's look at champagne. So, first of all, it's constraint. Um, you know, stock is everything. Uh, it costs money to hold stock in champagne. You know, it's not like Burgundy or Bordeaux where you hold bottles for 18 months and then, and then release after the harvest. <clears throat> you know, um, it, when you have a 2016 base vintage, they've been in your um, cellars for five, six, seven, eight years, you know. Um, that costs money in terms of... Um, sunk costs you've already sunk costs in, in into your sort of production and now you can't realize and, and and realize that margin until you release you know the accountants amongst you will probably appreciate the the level of inventory costs that that, that would have um, for domains secondly um there are considerations in in the way disgorgements work and um disgorgements are not a linear thing you know um you can have more recent disgorgements which can taste older than earlier disgorgements and that's down to the behavior of yeast and, and consumption of oxygen um, while on yeast. And that can actually differ between bottle formats, between grapes um, and, and between sort of even in between sort of um, oak and stainless steel. And, you know, that's another excellent sort of topic for a, a future, um, shall we call it? Um, and I call myself this a, a geeky look into uh, to yeast autolysis. Um, so I think the second consideration is the second one. I think the third consideration as well, and, th and this is the chief one, what works for the growers? I mean, I know that um, Olivier and, and other growers, they have sample disgorgements every six months. They take a disgorgement. Is this wine, uh, wine ready? And, and some growers, and I'm not sure Olivier does that. I know he's done this in the past uh, when he didn't have so much pressure on stock. They won't release a wine if it's not ready. You know, they test these wines, they add a dosage, they leave it three weeks and they say, Hey, is this wine ready for, for general release? No, I'll hold the wines back for another period. And, and I think um, this may be an example of that, you know, attention to quality. The wine's not ready, don't release it. And um, I think a comment on the, you know, in terms of the age of yeast autolysis for, for growers. And I think uh, unless you're a guy like Egli who likes to experiment with long yeast aging, for for guy like um, Olivier and, and others, 48 to 60 months is that sweet period. For me, you've got the right comparison between the fruit estuary sort of character and you've got the, the yeast autolysis character as well. And then look at the release date. So all of these have been released with just over 18 months post-disgorgement aging, you know. And even if you use very minimal um, sulfur dioxide at disgorgement, you know, that is the happy period. Um, 12 to 18 months, even for generic non-vintage non champagnes you will buy from, from a supermarket, for example. Give them 12 to 18 uh, months post disgorgement and the uptick in aromas, particularly for, um, and I will use original cork and non jetted disgorgement uh, wines, is, is, is incredible. If we talk about jetting and, 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 and DM closure, I think um, that's a whole new ball game in terms we have to give a little bit longer for those. But I know that um, Olivier doesn't use that. So, yeah, definitely 18 post months post disgorgement has really allowed for that um, aromatic uptick. And if any of you know um, sort of um, the, uh, the the film with, um, well, I forget the film about the, the band, um, uh, you know, and then they had this, um, uh, they had this amplifier and they had um, one to 10 and then they have number 11, you know, just um, uh, to turn up to, I think very much the 18 months for, for Olivier is the happy period. Turn, up, turn the amplifier up to number 11 on a 10, 10 number scale. And um, intensity, fruit, um, always in, a, in a, a more fresh style, but not without sort of um, weight, not without sort of some savouriness, but but it, it, it's volume on the palate. It really is that, that real expression intensity of fruit. We're now yeah, tasting the 14 versus the 15. Okay. 
I think there's March 21 discouragements and a February 22 discouragement you have. So <clears throat> again, almost all these ones will be discoursed during February and March. So there will all be a year apart from from these. So if we talk about the the vintage character, so um, the the fourteen um, versus fifteen versus sixteen vintage characters. <clears throat> fourteen is a very good Chardonnay um, vintage. Um, so uh, again, you're probably going to find that um, wine number fourteen is showing a little bit better there. Um, fifteen um, is a good Chardonnay vintage, a um, bit more ripe than than the cooler fourteen. Um, has a little bit that, of that uh, acidity on the finish, that greenness that I was on about from from the the heat stress that the vine suffered. And 16 is probably somewhere between the two. It's a little bit more ripeness than than uh, 14, uh, and and uh, but but less ripe than 15. And quality is, is pretty aggregate, uh, you know, aggregately good in uh, across the board in terms of ripeness and, and quality. Um, 15 Pinot Noir is probably more successful than 15 Chardonnay. I, I would suggest. You, so you like the Cote de Cezanne, then it's it's something that's hitting the spot. So it's in in ball. So um, it's. If, if we look at the, the vinification process, so um, uh, spontaneous um, ferments, so again, something that, that happens naturally um, rather than added yeast, um, and very slowly for first fermentation. So again, going against the recipe normal for champagne, which is a fast and hard first fermentation, uh, natural yeast and bottle without fil fi uh, filtering or fining, and then aged very short term in barrel before being assembled after one year. So if you look at... Um, Sort of the 2016, um, 2015 base, um, which would have been bottled in 16 and then was disgorged in in 21. So that's about uh, what about 60 months. So we don't have a lot of barrel aging here. So we have a lot of barrel fermenting, first fermentation. So the, the age of, of of wine number 14 or the the expression is coming with post um, uh, post disgorgement bottle aromas and you know because of the low dosage, because of the low sulfur regime. You're going to very, very quickly get that that um, uptick in aromas. You know, the evolution is going to be faster, medium term for these wines. So, you know, even a year will make a big difference. So wine number 15 was only disgorged um, 15 months ago, whereas wine number 14 was disgorged, I think, about um, 26 months ago. So you can see it makes a hell of a difference. I'm not clear what the import to, to regime. So, so importers for you guys have a lot of power, you know, because you buys buy the wine from them. So they can, the growers are very happy to accommodate you. Um, in Europe, we tend to get more of an aggregate, aggregated um, importer policy. So the, the wines here tend to be very much 48 to 60 months. So um, I know some growers keep back um, library stock. Um, so it may be that your importer um, sort of flexed his financial muscles and said, hey, we'd like to sort of take some wines with some some longer aging. And I think for the the, the Asian palate versus the English palate. So the English palate is is sort of the the, the, the go anglaise, which is the uh, freshest tasting all champagne, if um, as Tom Stevenson used to call it. And I think for the the Asian palate is is more for the the savory characters, the salty umami, you know, the real big expression of 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 fruit and oak and 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 um, and 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 yeast intensity. So I think for the longer aging is probably why those went to your market as opposed to Europe. You you guys are having too much fun. You you're doing too much drinking, not enough talking, and asking questions. This is going to be banned from the next Zoom. I'm, I'm going to cut down to five wines and then have a very um, sort of English and, uh, and and stable environment. I think I think we've clearly pivoted to drinking now. So, uh, absolutely. Any, any last questions for Steve? Otherwise, we let him go and enjoy his. What's his favorite? Oh, okay. Of, of all the producers, I mean, you've, you've okay, kind of hinted. I, 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 I tell you what I'll do. I, I tell you what I'll do. If you if you guys are in the drinking mode, um, if you can give me just two minutes, let me crack open something. Uh, I haven't got anything that you guys have got there, uh, myself, and and let's have a 15, 20 minute question round robin. If if you guys have got the time, I certainly have the time to spare. And you can ask some questions. We can just have a chat. Would, does that work for you? Sure. No okay. problem. Okay. Give me give me five minutes and I'll get some something in the glass. So I've I've gone very pedestrian. So I, I had a sample from uh, Maison uh, Charles Heidsieck um, for the 2017 um, based uh, Brut Reserve, um, which is um, a wine I haven't tasted yet, and I had it freshly chilled. So um, first of Sorry, all, can you hold up, can you hold up the bottle, <laughs> Steve? <laughs> Yes. Oh. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Hi, good man. Cheers, you're very good health. Thank you.
Charles Heintzak does some really good wines. I do indeed. So uh, I, I, I'm sorry it's not in the spirit of what we're tasting here, but it's um, uh, it's the only one I have chilled with me, and um, I, I've been promising to taste the sample for a while, but it's based upon the 2017 vintage, which was not, not a great vintage for Champagne, good for Chardonnay, not so good for Pinot Noir. Um, it's a blender's vintage, so guys like Charles Heidsick, so they now have reserve wines in oak. Um, they do a lot of stainless steel reserve wines. They are blenders extraordinaire, and um, and I have to say, this is very nice indeed. And um, you know they've embraced climate change. They've gone with this reserve wine philosophy where they have fresher stainless steel wines to complement uh, their condiment wines, as I would call them, which are the OJ oak age uh, reserve wines which are the salt and pepper to to add to the dish and um it's a little bit cold yet but i'm getting the really fine uh, lemony toast aromas and a, a little bit of vanilla nuance from the oak but only only very very small uh, and that fine crystalline sort of um, aromatics it's very very fresh very young so steve on that comment i mean the, the salon 07 should be a fantastic oh, wine right i am um, Mm, very good indeed um salon is a, a, a winemaker i get a little bit frustrated with in terms of their winemaking some of their um, winemaking is, is is quite oxidative even though they're very reductive so what i mean by that is they're reductive up until disgorgement then they don't add any sulfur at disgorgement so it becomes very oxidative in bottle so it tends to have a shorter curve for some vintages having said that it's all about balance and and and, and phenolics so if I look at Salon, I would always look at um, cooler years. So seven is a great Chardonnay vintage. It's a cooler year as well. Um, same as 2008. I mean, that's another great uh, vintage for Salon. Um, magnums of Salon are to die for still. Uh, I have no doubt about that. I have a couple of magnums of 2007 lying somewhere around here, um, which are desperately need me for not to look at the market price, but to sort of close my eyes and, and open one one day. And um and 2007 Salon, I actually think may surpass the 08 Salon. I'm going to call that one out because 07 Chardonnay is just so good. So what about 06, 4, 2? You said cooler vintage is better. Yeah, so yeah, so let, let's, um, excuse me, just grab my glass here. So um, 2002 is a very interesting vintage. Um, it's a vintage where um, on paper it was classic. At the time when we tasted the wines, they were extremely excellent. Um, what marks 2002 is uh, something called Pesserillage. Um, it's uh, a north drying wind which um, dehydrates uh, the grapes on the vine. So what that happens is, is that the moisture content of the, of the grapes drops and the phenol content, the dry extract, the acidities and all of those other things increases exponentially. So the must weights, I, I think we're off, off the charts for 2002. And, um, you know, when we tasted these wines, I mean, some of the wines... Uh, almost tasted uh, at Van Clare level uh, were like raisin, you know, raisin juice. They were just so mature, apricot, almost like um, a straw wine from, from Italy. And um, I, I think that um, misled certain people to think it was a super vintage, aromatically very mature, very weighted in the mouth. I mean, high alcohol levels. And, and so it's hyper concentrated. And that unfortunately has led to some oxidative tendencies. And I think um, we see this in O2 Don Perignon, and um, you know I, I've given that quite an ugly score. Um, when you see the report coming out, I'll, I'll reveal to you um, because the Chardonnay is just too mature and hyper concentrated, and I fear that O2 Salon may suffer from that in the in the long term. I think in the medium term, um, you know, you're going to get some good good progression in terms of um, evolution. But if if oily viscosity, mature uh, Chardonnay is your thing, you know, that real sort of oily, you know, almost like walnut oil mouthfeel is your thing, it's going to hit your bag, you know, and that's not for me, but for, for you guys, um, it, you know, that may be more up your street. 04, I think, is a sleeper vintage. As again, I've discussed the 03 effect of, of giving carbohydrate to the vines has meant that 04 is a very precocious vintage, quite balanced, very pretty, very charming vintage. It's going to age very well in bottle and superbly in um in in magnum 06 is somewhere between the two 06 um chardonnay um is a little bit difficult again it has a propensity towards maturity 06 don perignon and, and other wines show that as well uh 06 um comte de champagne also was an excellent wine but it was also showing that walnut oil sort of mid palate which is a signature of um of maturing chardonnay there's no doubt um salon will go the same way and again i, I employ you always for champagne if you can if you can afford it 
you know, sell the house, sell the wife, sell the kids, get magnums always, you know. Wait, uh, Steve, so always go, mag always go magnums over bottles, right? <laughs> always magnum over bottles. Magnums will, will be short and thrilling. Magnums will always be class, will always be fresher, invariably. And, you know, I have, there's something which I call the 4-3-2-1 rule. You know, four, four, four out of every 10 magnums are always far better. Three are out of every two. Uh, three out of every 10 are much better. Two out of every 10 are at least as good. Only one out of ten is poorer than the bottle. You know that's always the rule rule of thumb for me, and um, you know, and I I buy mag. I'd rather buy one magnum than, than three bottles. You know, every time. Do you, do you guys have any other questions? Steve, Steve, Steve. 2012 <laughs> versus 2013. <laughs> wow, uh, 2012. So what a vintage. Um, again, um, homogeneity in, in in champagne is something that doesn't really exist. You know, we we forget that um, if I sort of start driving from the north and and drive to the south on, you know, driving at the, the maximum speed limit that I can, it would still take me two and a half hours to get to the, the bottom of Champagne. So, you know, weather conditions are everything. So 2012 was probably more of a uniform vintage than 13, although there were some local issues with Chardonnay. For example, uh, up in Cramont and, and Chouilly in the north of Côte de Blanc, um, a lot of triage with, with frost and, and hail meant that the vintage was probably not as good as it, it could have been um in other areas of 2012 but um you know a lot of um uh, there was a lot of triage in terms of um green harvesting but also sort of frost damage to the vine so a natural uh, an unnatural density so natural uh, you know where you get a natural density through 2008 where long hang time so the grips on the on 103 days on average i think it gives a real long um, sort of phenolic input into the, the grapes 2012 had a little bit short on hang time, but more of a phenolic input from, from vine and precocity, you know, and that's because of the, the lower yields. So um, 2012, a Pinot Noir, excellent. Uh, Chardonnay is also very good, and so is, is Munir, but I think it is a Pinot Noir vintage. Um, blends have come across very good, a very easy vintage to like, you know, a lot of um, ripeness and good acidity too. Um, but, you know, um, the harvest time was, was very early in September. And, and so probably Verazon was in a, a warmer period. So you get that with a little bit of more of those fluffy um, sort of um, vintage character. Um, good, good potential though too. I mean, it's one of those um, uh, vintages that's flattering to deceive. So a lot of early aromatics, you know, ripeness, um, easy, easy to like, pretty flowery sort of um, aromas, but there is some dry extract lurking underneath that will develop very well. And as those early aromas drop out, that dry extract will, will reappear and, and really anchor that long-term aging. 2013 was also a ripe vintage, um, oddly enough, um, but also was a late vintage. I mean, historically, we have to go back to the 1990s to, to get a vintage which started in, in late September and finished in October. Uh, probably last the, the last October vintage of the, the 21st century that we will ever see. I mean, I'm unlikely to see that ever again. Um, we can talk about acidity. Acidity is a major feature. Uh, Verazon happened very, very late. Um, it's a very cool summer. So you get a lot of acidity in 2013 uh, and it's good, cool acidity. So you have malic acid, but you also have a ripe tartaric element as well. And that's because of the long hang time, a good Verazon, a good enzymatic uh, maturity in the vines but also some pr preservation from the cool nights of that acidity too and um you know the phenolics are off the chart i mean 2013 is is just superb i mean there's so much intensity there um it's a very interesting vintage in terms of terroirs whereas 2012 there are nuances across the board um 2013 has very individual almost exaggerated terroirs. I mean, terroirs came to the fore in, in that um, vintage. So for Cote de Blancs, it is classic cool with great acidity. Um, 2013 on the, the northern Montagne de Rance, so it's uh, sort of lewd, versi, versi, ne, mei, grand cru. Um, again, another cool vintage um, with a lot of um, um, acidity, a lot of dry extract, very, very lot of pear characters, a lot of that... Um, real sort of neutral and mouth watering intensity. Ambonet on the south, um, oddly enough, was a, a ve very ripe vintage. A lot of um, orchard fruits, apple um, fragrances, very mature, lower acidity, um, uh, slightly different and, and slightly audible versus the rest of um, Champagne. 
the OPE had a, a lot of difficulties too with again with low yields and um but again tends to be a riper vintage with some acidity um and and I looked to the Grand Valley de la Man uh, again I was a, a great village in 13 but it tends to be more riper and, and more akin to the southern uh, Montana runs more akin to Ambonay and uh, and and that area and and again a thrilling vintage and as a blend 2013 was superb to blend you could just almost like five or six different vintages in one you could blend across uh, grand marks are superb in 13 they can just pick their palette of colors and and just assemble these beautiful framework beautiful bouquet of uh, base ones for us you know so yeah, steve that's cool. why your john perion report yeah, has a very that's high that's score that's for that's the 13 vintage right really Agreed. It's it's a superb wine. And, you know, 13 Dom Perignon as well. They're a winemaking adjustment. Um, but um, hey, if you're uh, JMIB subscribers, um, which I hope you all are, um, you will indeed sort of see that report released. I think it's going to be today, is it? Or, or maybe soon, um, Michael. Um, and I talked about it. Where's that going to be? Sorry? Yes, I believe so. Correct. Okay. And and I'll talk a little bit about um, what um, Dom Perignon do, do as winemakers. So, you know, it's... It's for me. It's not a, a question of grow maker growers versus um, you know the big grand mark winemakers. It, it's a, a version a, a version of their expression of their terroirs, and you can have grand terroirs on a very high level, or you can have the fractal terroirs of of the growers and different winemaking techniques too. And and um, you know both are thrilling in their own way and and for different reasons. But you know thirteen um, Dom Perignon, I it's a very sappy style are very much of the dry extract coming to the fore a lot of that mouth watering dry extract acidity and you know it may not age, age as long as as the earlier vintages you know for different reasons and, and i explain more in the report but yeah it's it's a wine which is simply superb so steve i think uh, now that we've entered into food what i just say hold on, hold on give me a second just want to say thank you, Steve, for all the time. Very well researched. Very good job. Thank you. Okay. And I am. Um, you've given us inspiration for the next tastings. Indeed. Uh, bottle magnum and double magnums or geros of uh, the same vintage of Dom. Twenty um, vintages. Absolutely. That 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 sounds like a plan. And um and you know you just feel sorry for the poor sommelier having to deal with those sort of bottle sizes. But hey. Um, we all have to earn our money, you know. So thanks, guys. Um, it's been fantastic talking to you uh, for Zoom. Hopefully this is one of many. Um, I wish you bon appetit. And I'm always here. Please feel free to um, contact me. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Hopefully um, I'll share those details with um, with you after the, the meeting. Um, I'll also publish the my facts and, and notes as well. And enjoy. Good to talk to you guys.